The Dark Heart of Every Wild Thing Chapter One All week we'd found tracks by the river. Tracks leading up to the scree where the waters of the spring deigned down from the melt high up on the mountain. It had been dark still when we'd lit out from camp, drifting down to the river and north along its shore through the mountain ash and the pine trunks laden with lichen. He would raise his hand and point out over the river when the woods filled with the song of the common loon, would raise his other and point deep into the birches when the saplings cracked with the hammering of woodpeckers, black-backed, downy, flicker. The rifle hung on his back with the moon still in its oil, his tall boots shimmering with dew. He found them first, in the soft mud of the river bank, not yet frozen with winter, two piles of scat, fresh and still steaming with body heat. Night still hung in the spruces, like bucks swinging by their antlers toward the river, and I watched him crouch to pick up a lump and roll it between his palms, searching it for bones and fur. Yes, he said. So this was the one we'd followed on the south slope, where the hares had bedded down in late summer under the deadfall to litter, out of the way of the wind. He wiped his hands on his thighs and stood looking into the tree line, rocking his head back to taste the air. He was nine then, and his close-cropped hair was the salt and tawny color of the animal we hunted, his eyes the slate gray of the sea. Slowly I watched him turn east and head into the birches, and I knew now I would have to be his follower. The sun had risen through the branches, and the wind was calm. A half mile into the trees we came to a talus at the foot of the cliff, shale and glacial in the mist. He laid his palms on the rock face and drew them downward, letting the flints break away and crumble at his touch. For an hour we moved north along the face, walking in the moss just to the west of the talus to muffle us. The mountain had groaned and shifted with the eons, and when we came to a fissure we knew it ran deep into the stone and opened far above where the rains and snows had worn down the shale of the higher ground. He squeezed his way in, and I could tell by his voice that he was looking up into the belly of the mountain. Slipping off the pack, my chest leveling as I emptied it, I shouldered into the opening and found him inside, standing in the vast chamber of the cavern and pointing up to where it climbed into the rock and opened onto blue October sky. As a wave of foliage tumbling down through a cavern will rise up on a vortex and search itself along the high, dark walls of granite, so will a boy's voice, and for a long moment I stood behind him and listened to the music of his name casting itself back to him on the downdraft, his large hands resting on his shoulders where he'd crossed them. Shouldering the pack, I knotted the rope around my waist and harnessed him, letting him climb behind me on the loose ruins of the cavern wall, both of us sliding backward until my hands found solid stone, and I hauled us up in lurches toward the light. The slope turned mild, old stoned, and when we reached the top I let him slide in front of me and lift his head into the brilliance, his gray eyes squinting as he scanned the scrub along the ridge, and when I felt him nodding, I pushed him up over the edge onto the shale. Unknotting the rope, I let him lift and spool it into his pack above, the dank air of the cavern dripping back from the braided fibers into the quiet of the half-dark, and hitching my leg on a stone, I swung myself up until I was standing beside him in the autumn air. From where we stood, we could see the river below, and beyond it the pines in the valley. Ahead of us the mountain rose to the snow-slicked ledges, barren and granite, but we knew we would not have to work much higher. We were near the timber line, and when we moved out onto the trail that ran along the ridge, we could feel the wind rising up from the valley floor, the fine scent of pine sap sliding up the mountain to meet us. By noon we'd reached the flat high ground that opened onto old growth, deep firs and larches, the sun warm on our shoulders where the rifles had hung. We carried them now, 
and in the dizziness of the autumn heat we could hear red tails scratching the air above us, coyotes yipping as they cornered their prey in the valley below, hares unzipping the clover with the rust of last month's snares still snarled in their fur. At the cleave of the dry creek bed we climbed down out of the scrub and followed the path the waters had taken. He shuffled in front of me, and let his left hand rise and fall like the skittish flight of the swallows that would abandon those woods each summer, the last of them lingering until the first snows weighed the pines and ushered them down to the south and the cobalt shore, their numbers darkening the sky where tourists drew long sips of rum on the docks and watched the fishing skiffs ride out into early morning. In our camps at night I would tell him stories of the Caribbean, of the long liner I shipped out on in the years before I met his mother, of the way I could lie perfectly exhausted in the rigging at night and listen to the sharks and the waves below, worrying over the scraps the captain had thrown them, their dark heads rising like stones for the young men who beat them back for play. Were you scared? No. The rigging was woven strong, and I liked the sound of them. He rolled over and laid his head on my chest as I spoke, and in the last light I could see he was looking up at me with his slate still eyes. But what if you fell? I told him then about the dolphins, the legends of them that every fisherman disbelieved and every fisherman trusted. I told him how they would come bounding over the waves and turn circles around a man in trouble, warding off the sharks or lifting him on their backs if he was drowning. I told him how boatmen had been found hundreds of miles from where they'd been lost, exhausted but treading water among the pod that had carried them, their eyes astonished by the mercy of it. But there are no land dolphins, silly. What? I looked and saw he had rolled his head to the side and was listening to my heart in the darkness. What will carry us on land if we're in trouble? In the creek bed I watched him lift and dive his hand as though it were cresting the waves, the cotton at his shoulders dark from the sweat flourishing in his body. We ate in the lee of a deadfall, breaking the black bread and dipping it into the cans of beans we'd carried in the packs. We wished we'd had the anchovies, their small salted bodies to spread with our thumbs on the bread, the heads hard and oily, the little bones crushing in the dark meat of the fillets. But that was for last camp when the hunt was over. The beans were already too much, but we loved them and needed the nourishment, and when he tilted the can back to his mouth and knocked on the bottom with his mitten, I knew I would never say no to him. I knew I would carry him over this land if we were in trouble. We followed the creek bed all afternoon and into evening, gathering and twining kindling from the deadfalls, and when we made camp it was near a grove of larches on a small rise where the ground was dry and the foliage had been swept away by the wind. I lifted him on my shoulders where he hung the packs in a cedar against the bears, and with the hand axe we cut wood for fire, the larch sap beating from the grains, so I knew it would make steam. In the late light, for our bed, I cut spruce to spread on the ground between two white pines. We'd brought no tent, but the horsehair blanket and the eider down would be warm, and we would climb in together with the spruce branches below us, and I would hold him close in the winds that were sure to rise up from the valley in the night. Always he would give in to sleep first, and when I lay awake looking up at the stars through the pines, I would feel the waves lifting me in the rigging off the coast of La Alta Gracia, the wind hanging still in the harbor, the salty tang of the ocean air and the heat of the evening breeze against my chest always made me think of the villages, and in the moonlight I could rock myself to sleep and dream of the strong hands of the fishermen's daughters stitching the rigging in their rooms, the blind and beautiful woman who had cleaned fish on the docks of La Romana for thirty years, whose hair smelled of liver oil and cinnamon and citronella. Once I had taken her to my room, and though she was not young, she moved like a foal in her shyness, 
and when we sat on the edge of my bed, we drank palm wine wordlessly while the radio lisped of jazz from the north. Now in the night, I saw again the candlelight on the backs of her wrists, her flesh still glimmering with the scales of jack she'd not scrubbed off, and I thought of the fish hauled up from the depths in darkness, fighting all the way until the bladder ruptured and they floated up to the surface where fishermen would handle them. I thought of the jack carried on a string across a boy's back to where she waited on the dock, how he touched her on the shoulder three times to tell her how many, slipping a coin into her left breast pocket as she sharpened the knife on a stone. Always his hand lingered there a moment, this boy from Santo Domingo with no mother and no father, his hands tattered from the moorings, his face scarred by something from the depths, his lemon-scented shirt snapping in the evening breeze. Always he would whisper the same joke about the knife and his rudeness, and always she would lower her head and smile and listen to him go. In my room she had not told me her name, though the men had called her La Paloma for years, singing to her across the docks as her father had sung to her while he tarred the roofs of the bait shacks beyond the dunes as she lay in the sand with her feet in the tide, counting her dark beads in the sun. La Paloma, La Paloma, mi corazón. Escucha, she whispered. Listen, we are cast off so we can be astonished. We are abandoned so we can be found. We did not make love, but she let me scrub the shining from her wrists in the basin by the bed, slowly and with a tenderness I'd forgotten. And in the yellow pine of my threshold, she let me take her waist in my arms and kiss her once deeply before she lowered her head and backed out into the night, like a foal with its blinders on, the radio still murmuring behind me its blue news of the delta. I switched it off and sat on the bed and looked out the window at the moon bobbing in the empty skiffs of the harbor. In the night he'd climbed under the eider down again, and I could tell from the sound of his breathing that he was cold, his mittened fingers tucked up into his flannel and bald under his chin. I cut the twine from a bundle of kindling and spread it out on the ground so it would be ready. From my breast pocket I pulled a clod of moss and some scrapings of birch bark, rolling them into a tinder nest that I placed on the kindling and weighed down with a cross of twigs against the wind. Sniffing deep of the pitch, I drove one end of each log into the cold earth and balanced the others at a point above the tinder, fixing them into what he had always called a fire teepee. Wolves keened on the other side of the river. When I'd stitched the gaps with kindling, I watched the match leave its track on the dry fiber of my thigh until the air split with the earthen scent of sulfur, and I held it into the dark above the larches. Do it with a flint. He'd sat up in the eider down, and when I turned, I saw his soft jaw and the moon and his tawny hair, and I remembered how much he looked like his mother. Do it with the flint and the knife. I smiled at him and blew out the match, sliding the matchbook back into my pocket and flicking the knife in its sheath at my thigh. The flint's with the packs, I whispered. I heard him climb from the eider down, spruce branches snapping under the horsehair, until he tapped me on the back where I crouched in the half-dark. Clasping his shins, I shouldered him over to the packs where they hung in the cedar, my legs tired and aching while he searched the pockets in the mist above and brought out a small parcel wrapped in cotton. I carried him back and lowered him onto the bedding as he bit off his mittens. Hair blood under his fingernails, he unwrapped the flint from the cotton and crawled over to the wood, Autumn in his fingers as he pulled a scrap of char cloth from his back pocket and wrapped it around the flint. His hand was watery, minnow thin, and when I held out the field blade between my forefinger and thumb, he took it in one clean motion and whisked it down the stone, a spark arcing up into the night and sputtering in the air. He turned to me and grinned. A moon sheared in the shoulders of his flannel, as he crouched down to shift one of the logs aside, and when he propped his elbow in the moss I could hear him scraping away in the dark and blowing on the tinder nest when he halted. 
On the seventh try he laid the knife and flint beside him and crouched lower, blowing steadily on the char and cupping his ungloved hands against the kindling and the larches. When the fire bloomed it was quick and strong, and it almost seared his hair as he rocked upright and turned to me in the glow. Should I throw some spruce on it? The short, blue-green needles were stitched with sap, dried and warm under the horsehair, and when he wove them into the logs they curled and hissed as a thick opal smoke twisted up into the branches above, and the fire was lit. Larch sap lingered on his hands in the eider down, its resin scent braiding with the deep loam of the horsehair, the brine in it. For years I'd thought to swap the brash, stiff heft of the horsehair for a bearskin, soft and dark above and cured with acid and bran below, to keep the wet earth from our shoulders. But the horsehair was woven fine from the sorrel and bay ponies of the shore, and when you rolled over in the night and pressed your nose into its weft, you could smell the aspen still in their manes, the promise of wherever they were going. In the night I listened to him breathing, and when he rolled in his sleep and tucked his head under my arm and nuzzled there, I knew he was dreaming of his mother. It had been quick, they'd said. The doe had stumbled through the foliage into the headlights, and when you swerve for mercy, you swerve truly and unfalteringly. The car had turned sharp and struck the guardrail and rolled, and when two hikers found her, there had been no pain. He was seven then, and we lived on in the house that looked out over the gray ash of the waves on the Oregon coast, and in the first nights after her funeral I built a fire on the beach where we sat together looking out over the water. It was mid-autumn, and the young octopuses that sometimes lost themselves in the current were washing up and twisting in the bull kelp and sea lettuce and alaria. We walked together along the water and gathered them in the coat I'd taken off to tie into a bindle, packing them in with the seaweed with which we lifted them, and when I laid them out on a skiff's plank over the fire, two at a time, they spat and fizzled, his gray eyes fixed on my ring finger, until I slipped the salt shaker from my left breast pocket and watched them contract while he turned away. I cooled the plank in the sand and squeezed lime on the tentacles, splitting their brown bodies with the field knife and rubbing them in the alaria. We couldn't eat the weed, I told him, but the flavor was dark and rift deep, working its way into the pink inner flesh of the octopuses and giving them a sweetness that could sting you with its lingering. Each evening for a week we ate them, each afternoon and evening, washing them down with bottles of root beer or orange crush or cream soda, and in the eighth day we doused the fire and threw the last logs in the cooking plank, one by one, into the breakers, listening to the soft hiss as the smoke rose up into a moon that had turned back and watched over us, and by morning would be gone. Night kept me close, her long washed hair, silk in the quick between her shoulders, and when I woke from her hold, he was not near. Dark still hung in the spruces, and when I listened I could hear the soft fizzle of him urinating in the wood fern. The Cherokee had called the fern Yonatseus, and when a child was snake-bit they would suck out the poison and wrap the wound in fern leaves, rubbing the soft spores into the blood and asking the world to grow in him again. If the child lived, they made tea from the leaves, cupping it steaming in their hands, until the hunters who drank it knew themselves stronger and swifter than they had been. They danced for two days, and on the third day they moved out into the forests to hunt the thing they had only dared to dream of. He was shaking the pine needles from his hair when he climbed back into the eider down and held me. You shouldn't go too far in the night. I know. Did you see the moon? He was nodding in the firelight, his eyes closed. Do you remember the moon over the ocean when we made fire and ate the octopus? Not really. I thumbed the pine needles from his hair and let my fingers stall in the sap at his temples. 
I was waiting, and I knew it would not be long. We burned things, he whispered. His voice was muffled in my flannel as he remembered. We burned the antlers of a big buck, and they smelled like when she was making bread. I waited for him to tell it. You went back to the house and left me with the fire, and when you came back you had the huge antlers Pop gave you, and when you put them on the fire, the smell was everywhere. It stayed in our clothes a long time. His lips were pressed into my armpit for warmth, warming me. It did, didn't it? I could feel him nodding. And when they wouldn't burn, you carried them down to the water and just left them there. In the morning they were gone. I think someone took them. He breathed and buried himself deeper. In the keening of the geese high above the timber, I remembered my father lifting a buck's head to the kitchen window, tapping the antlers on the glass where my mother stood washing mason jars in the early light. She spooked back as she always would, and when she heard him laughing through the siding, she slapped her palm on her knee and let out a roiling belly laugh that tossed her hair and pinched her eyes and shook her spoon collection on the kitchen wall behind her. There was one from every state, a gaudy pineapple stem painted yellow and green from Hawaii, a sterling peach tree from Georgia, an intricately embellished snowflake motif on the long stem that formed the Aleutian Islands. In the nights when the walls themselves bickered, I'd lie in bed and imagine where each spoon had come from, the places I hadn't been and the feasts I'd never tasted, and by morning I'd stare at them on the wall while I stirred my empty bowl, dreaming always of new worlds and wild miles of canyons and arroyos and rivers with names like the queens of other lands. In my school books I'd write their names and imagine wading across them or floating downstream in a canoe I'd hollowed from a single trunk with my own hands, the sounds of unknown birds around me and a song on my lips I'd not yet begun to whistle. And the antlers had the velvet on them still, I said. He was nodding again. The velvet burned, but the bone didn't. It just got black, really black. People started watching. That's a lot for a little boy to remember. He need me. I'm not little. What about the scar? As the wind rose, I let my palm slide onto the back of his neck, feeling for the bump of a long-heeled wound running down from his hairline into the fibers of his collar. When he was six, he'd asked to ride a neighbor's gelding on the beach, a big pinto with a moon-blind eye and a temper like heat lightning, and although his mother had frowned, I lifted him onto the saddle and walked him through the sand while he swung his arm like a caballero. All that summer he'd watched the yearlings that were always brought down to the cool sands to be broken, learning to sink their hooves into the shallows where the young girls would ride them into autumn. Now in the wild I felt my body stumbling again and dragging the horse's head down by the bridle, rolling away from it as it reared back in panic and started to gallop toward the surf, his fists buried deep in its mane in silence. When it threw him, his body slammed shut like our breath in that moment, and when he'd lain in the hospital that night, she'd cradled him and kissed his chin and whispered that he'd ridden well. You said I took the stitches like a man, and when the horse started to run, I showed I wasn't a boy anymore, and I had the scar to prove it. I did say that, didn't I? And you were right, right? Foal done, rolling in the open, the sun struggled across the wet foliage on the lower ground. He turned away from me, and I could tell by the way he spoke that his eyes were closed again, and he was half asleep. Slipping back the eider down to stretch, I stood and worked my shoulders into mourning. For an hour or more I watched him sleep, his breath misting the air and his fists bundled before him. To hunt a mountain lion without dogs, to track and tree it, was something any proper hunter would have merely laughed at, and rightly so, perhaps. But for reasons I have never quite worked out, it had to be the two of us alone in those mountains. My father and I had hunted buck in his time, scouring those grounds together each open season for two months or more. But always there was another world passing us by, a world we never stepped into. 
the ancient voice of some other wild thing calling out in the darkness of the timber. You can kneel the deer, I'd learned, as the gods once bowed the hearts of men time and again, because it cannot learn. But the lion, the mountain lion, was the mind of the wild. My father had never taken one, nor his father before him, and if I was going into those snows, I was going to make them mine, and I'd known so from the first days with my father. Now in those shadows, I knew it had to be the two of us, my son and I, and that we would carry our quarry down from the mountain, and we would tell of it, and no one could tell us that it wasn't so. I let him sleep on, and when he rose, I'd loaded the thirty aught six and the twenty-two, and was waiting by the fire to douse it when he was ready. Light was nipping at the pine trunks, a wind picking up from the valley. The cat would be done with its own hunt by now, lying in a thicket to rest itself in the grounds above. When he was ready, I helped him roll the horsehair and the eider down, larch smoke unstitching itself from their fibers as we tied them, and we left the spruce branches for bedding between the pines. Something can use it to fawn in. He was thumbing the sleep from his eyes as he spoke, his wool cap dangling from his pocket as he shivered. His hair more blonde than tawny in the early light, he was yawning as I lifted him on my shoulders, his body drowsy with the odor of smoke. Wolves sang on the wind as he gathered the packs. When I'd set him down again, I strapped the eider down to his bundle and handed him the twenty-two with the safety on, mussing his cowlick with the horsehair. I slung the thirty-aught six onto my back and nodded into the pines of the north slope, their dark scars climbing toward the firs at the timber line. Yes, I said, and we moved off in the underbrush to where lions were.